I'm sorry, I'm just so sore. I mean, people laugh at it, but, but it really does hurt when you fall out of heaven. <laughs> oh, pastor pickup lines, everyone. Pastor pickup lines. Hey, welcome to Hope Church. If this is your first time with us online or in the room, thank you so much for being here. My name is Jason. Uh, I get to be the lead pastor at just an awesome church. And if this is your first Sunday here, uh, you picked a really great Sunday to be here as we're talking about relationships in this series. Now, most of us began learning about the idea of a paradigm to relationship seasons uh, somewhere around third grade, and uh, the, the learning went something like this. Jason and Kathy sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N, first comes, then comes, then comes, baby in a baby carriage. Now, what it lacked in detail, it made up in simplicity and and rememberability, because we all remember that paradigm. But then we grew up, and what we learned is that's not the paradigm that we all move through when it comes to our relationship seasons. I mean, some of us, we went straight from sitting in the tree to kissing to baby. Or, Or some of us went from Uh, Kissing to love, to married, to baby, to stressed out, to infidelity, then came divorce. And we all move through these different relationship seasons, and, and every relationship season brings a really strong emotional charge with it. Well, to get started, what I want to show you is, um, in theory, if, if someone lived a life in, with God's blessing, and it just followed kind of a progression of, of what the biblically lined up seasons of relationship are, it would go something like this. The first season is Jason and Kathy sitting in a tree, single, right? That, that's, that's where we all start. Did I not turn the TV on today? Um, the TV has no power, so if someone can help me with that. It's on the screen behind me. The first uh, season we start out with is the season of being single. And that's the thing you have in common with everyone on the planet who has ever lived. And then after that, we move into a season of dating if there's mutual interest. And you meet someone and you get to know each other. And if that goes well, if the dating goes well, then you move to a season of being engaged, right? And that's where you plan for marriage and get ready for marriage. And what comes after the season of being engaged, everyone? Hope's pre-marriage classes. That's what comes after you get engaged. And lucky for you, they're only three weeks away. So if you are dating or engaged, get signed up now because it is so easier to resolve marriage problems before you get married. And we help you do that. Then after Hope's pre-marriage class, then comes the wedding. Then comes being married. And then after being married, along comes love. To which you say, wait a minute, didn't that come somewhere further upstream? I don't think so. At least not if you go with the biblical definition of love. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13 read, where we're told love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not rude, it is not proud, it is not self, all those things about love, and you're like, when does the open bar start, right? When you're at the wedding and that goes on. I don't think you're, not you, other people, I don't think we're capable of that level of selfless love without being in a marriage covenant. So marriage covenant makes it possible for us to really have that level of commitment in our relationships. Then, after love, if God blesses and if you desire, then come children, and then the cycle repeats with love again as you now uh, really understand a different level of what it means to be patient and kind at 2 a.m. when they're up crying. So that's kind of the relationship progression uh, that we would see uh, laid out in the Bible. Uh, Well, in this series, what we're doing is we're not looking at all the relationship series uh, seasons that we can go through in life. We're just focusing on three of them. We're focusing on being single, married, and dating, but in the actual order. Single, dating, and married is what we're looking at in this series. And what we're learning is that in every single relationship season, there's a specific goal that you want to prioritize and shoot for. And in fact, if you can drive your whole life and your relationship toward the best goal, you will have the best relationship. And there's three reasons why you want to know your goal in every relationship season. The first is that goals guide and align your focus. 
Okay, there's a lot of things that need our energy, a lot of things that need our time, but if you have a goal when it comes to your relationship season, it guides your focus. Second, goals help you avoid distraction. There's so many things competing for your attention, it helps you push away what you say isn't your top priority in life. How many people do you know who, by the time their kids leave home and they realize, I didn't even prioritize what I thought was most important with my life? Goals help you eliminate distractions. And third, goals give you neutral feedback. If you're in a relationship, you get feedback all the time. Very little of it is received as being neutral. If you have a goal you're shooting for, hey, the the goal doesn't care. It's just telling you your feedback. Are you progressing toward your goal? And last week, the big idea was simple. There's one relationship goal that permeates all seasons for people who are wise, and the goal is this. The first relationship goal is a relationship with God because God, we learned last week, is love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past have existed in a community of perfect love and joy and bliss and happiness, and He created us in order to expand His love that we might find our purpose and joy and meaning in God and in His love. You see, you have two choices in life. You can write a story that stars you with your life, and you can do that, and you can be successful, and you can be the star, and five years after you retire or five years after you're dead, nobody's going to remember or talk about your story. Or you can use the story of your life to be a very bit part in the big eternal story of God and find your joy in His presence, in His love. Find your delight in Him both on earth and forever in heaven. That's what we were made for. And when we prioritize this in every relationship season, we are connected and plugged in with the God who is love. Because without that love, it is very difficult to always be patient and kind and everything that love requires of us. So starting today, we're going to look at specific goals for each relationship season, and we're going to start with being single. What's the goal if I'm single? Now, if you're not single, don't check out, don't turn off YouTube. Here's the reason why this is worth the price of your attention. The relationship seasons are not only sequential, but the goals of the seasons stack on each other. And if you missed the right target when it comes to being single. I promise you that is showing up in your current relationship season. And you just didn't know what it was. You didn't know how to put a finger on it, but it is showing up. And what you need to do if you're going to get your current relationship season back on track where you want it to be, you're going to have to do a little bit of makeup work from the goal you missed in the previous season. And and I'm not going to beat you up about that. Uh, God doesn't want to beat you up about that because what I said last week is true. Nobody here is in a perfect relationship regardless of your season. We're not valuing being perfect in our relationships. We're valuing progress taking steps toward the right goal for this relationship season. So if you are not currently single, I think you will still find this incredibly relevant for your life. And if you are single today, uh, we're going to talk about you. Is it okay to ask who's single in the room? I just want you guys to be able to find each other, help you guys out. You know what I mean? All right. Um, To to help us with this, we're going to go to a place in the Bible uh, called 1 Corinthians, which was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Corinth was a church um, in an ancient uh, Greek city. It's kind of like modern-day Las Vegas, what happened in Corinth. Didn't always stay in Corinth. Um, But that was kind of their culture, and they had a lot of questions about what it looked like to follow Jesus in their church. And 1 Corinthians, in their culture, 1 Corinthians 7, is all about relationships, being single, being married, being widowed, all these relationship seasons. Um, And and if this is interesting to you, you can go home and you can read the chapter by yourself. We're just going to focus on the verses where Paul talks about being single, and the wisdom he has for people who are single. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. Paul wrote them this, I wish. Now, he starts that way because he knows this can't happen, but when he blows out his birthday candles, this is what he wishes for. I wish that all of you were as I am. Now, he's not talking about, I'm Captain Awesome Sauce, be like me. What he's talking about in context is his relationship status. And do you know what his status was? Single. Paul was a single man. He was single for his entire life. And when he writes to them about relationships, he says, my wish is that all of you fools who got married could be like me and be single. Look at this. But 
Each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Here's what he's saying. I wish you could be single like me, but I'm sure God still loves you, right? Um, he, he's saying, I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure God's blessing your life in some way, but here's, he's saying that, you know what? Being single is not only a gift from God, but it is a gift I wish you could have. Now, now if you got married, there's, there's blessing in that to be sure. But look at how he starts by elevating singleness. He says, singleness is a gift. Singleness is a gift. It's important to frame it up this way. Because think of how much in our culture our identity is tied to our relationship status, especially if you're single. I mean, if you go to the doctor and you have to fill out the medical form, you have to check the box. Are you married, divorced, or single? And you're thinking to yourself... I just needed my teeth cleaned. Thank you for reminding me I don't have a date this weekend. When you fill out your taxes, you have to check the box that says you're single when you're out with friends or with your parents or at a family reunion. They always ask, so are you seeing anyone? And if you're single by choice, you start to think, do they just think there's something wrong with me because I choose to be single? But if you're single not by choice, you're like, is there something wrong with me? And you're filled with doubt or perhaps insecurity. Why doesn't anyone find me desirable? Or maybe it's fear, fear that you're always going to be alone, fear that you'll never get married. Or maybe it's the opposite for you. It's fear of marriage because uh, you look at your parents' marriage or you already experienced your own first marriage and you're afraid of getting married. The entire category of marriage is something that you don't want anything to do with anymore. In traditional cultures... Family was everything. And you're nobody if you're single. You have to get married and have a family and be somebody. Well, we don't live in that culture anymore. Uh, in the modern culture, our status and our sense of identity is all about self fulfillment and individualism and freedom, which has ironically made being single even harder because now our culture says, if you want to be single, that's fine. If you want to date someone, that's fine. If you want to hook up, that's fine. But if you are going to be in a relationship, it has to be all about you, you know, because it's all about self-fulfillment and realizing your true potential. So it has to be someone who's all put together and well-educated and good-looking and makes a lot of money and a great sense of humor, and somehow they're still into you. And, and there's just incredible pressure to find that right person. And if you're not in a relationship, then you're left wondering, is there no one who finds me to be a, someone desirable? That puts enormous pressure on dating and being single. And oftentimes you're left feeling dejected or lonely. Paul pushes against all the cultures. In fact, he has a view of being single that is more elevated and dignified than all of the cultures, either traditional or modern. And his view is that being single is a gift. In fact, he wishes everyone could have his gift. He says, if you're married, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's giftedness in that, but I really wish you could be single like me. Now, I know that a lot of us are pushing back right now saying, Jason, I'm single, and it doesn't feel quite like a gift. Now, Paul anticipated our objection. So here's what he wrote a few verses later to explain why it's a gift. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. He says, listen, if you're single, embrace it. Be single to the max. Okay, if you get married, you're not doing wrong. Go, if you get married, that's fine. Go ahead and get married. But man, I think you're better off being single. Here's his reasoning. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you of this. No amens and no elbows. Just listen up for a second. He says, if you get married... You will face many troubles. Listen, if you're single and you view marriage or dating as a solution to your troubles, you have it backwards. You have it backwards. Hooking up with someone, dating someone, getting married to someone will not solve your troubles. It will create more troubles. Guys, if you are single, let me tell you what happens after work. You get home, you put a hot pocket in the microwave, you sink into your couch, you let the ESPN wash 
all your pain away. It is so good. If you get married, those days are over, son. As soon as you get engaged, you're going to find yourself going to places where you never thought you would go. You would go beyond those places. You would go to places like Bed, Bath, and beyond for the gift registry, and she's going to hold up a couple of plates and say, which plate should we get? Do you like this one or this one? This one or this one? I can't decide. And you say, honey, you just pick. No, I need your help. I can't decide. And you say, it's not that I don't care which plates we get. It's that I can't care. I'm not emotionally (laughs) capable of caring which plates plates we get. And, and why are we getting all of these throw pillows and placemats? Who's making us do this? Why are we doing this? But if you say these things out loud, you're going to have many troubles. And then you're going to get home from work and you think you're going to grab that beer and sit on the couch and turn on the TV. Oh no, son. She's going to sit down next to you and she's going to want to hear about your day and it's fine. Isn't going to cut it. She's going to want the details and know about your day, but it's just a trap because she wants to tell you about the details of her day and you're going to have to put down the remote and listen to her with your face. (laughs) And you're going to have to go there emotionally and say, that does sound rough. I I don't know how I would feel about that, but don't you dare solve the problem. You just listen to her. And you're going to repeat that every single day until you die. (laughs) Ladies, you meet Mr. Right, and he's wonderful, and you get married, and he has a level of hygiene and cleanliness It's not that it's low, it's that it's dangerous. It is not safe to live as a human being in this environment. Paul says, listen, if you get married, you will face many troubles. Now you can give your amen. And he wants to spare you of this. Now, this next section that he writes is so weird that I'm going to give you a handle to put on it so you can, like, have a handle on what he says next. At first, like, what is he talking about? So, so here's the handle I want to give you for this entire next section so you can grab onto it. Don't get carried away. Okay, everything that comes in this next paragraph, put this handle on it. Don't get carried away. Okay, ready? What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if They do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Let's go back a slide. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For... This world in its present form is passing away. Now, now, what in the world is Paul talking about? Because here he says, those who have wives should live as if they do not. But in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, he said, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he said that a husband and wife ought to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But here he says, you should live as if you don't have a wife. And he says, if you mourn, live as if you're not mourning, but... Other places were told that we're to grieve with those who grieve, and and many of the Psalms in the Old Testament are about mourning and grieving and laments. And the book of Proverbs teaches us to be wise in our commerce and in our dealings and to save for the future and be responsible people. So so what's he saying here when he says, live as if you don't even have these things. Live as if they're not even real. Well, what he's doing is he's applying a very mature theology to our relationships. And the theology he's applying is the fact that before Jesus came into the world, many believers assumed that when God's Savior, the Messiah, would finally show up, that would be the end of all pain, that would be the end of all suffering, that would be our final and full liberation. But Jesus said, I've come to bring the kingdom of heaven near." And he did that not by coming to bear judgment on sin, but to bear sin from the sinners. 
And on the cross, he bore our sin, took our place under God's wrath to bring the kingdom of heaven near. What that means is we can now access, we can now enter God's presence, God's kingdom, God's love, God's mercy, citizenship in God's kingdom through repentance and faith. I turn away from my sin. I confess that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose on the third day, and we enter into God's kingdom, which means right now, as soon as you believe in Jesus, as soon as you put your trust in him, you are forgiven. You are a citizen of heaven. Your judgment day has already taken place. God loves you. He's delighted in you. He forgives you. He has a purpose for you. He calls you his child right now. That's already happened, but Jesus has not yet returned. He has not yet ended pain and sorrow and brought final judgment on those who would do evil. He has not yet fully ushered us into the presence of God in eternity. And Paul is saying, you live in this time in between. The kingdom of God has come near, but Jesus has not yet returned. We live in this time anticipating eternity. So whatever season you're in, whatever you have, whatever your reality, don't get carried away. Listen, he says, don't get carried away with with your amount of wealth, whether it's a lot or a little, because this is not the only wealth you have. This is the, in this time, wealth you have, eternity's coming, and all the wealth you could imagine is waiting for us. Don't get carried away. Don't get carried away with your health. Whether you have great health or terrible health, don't get carried away, because it's just your health right now, resurrected life, is coming where we will enjoy perfect health. And when it comes to marriage and singleness, whatever your status, he says, don't get carried away. Why? Two answers. The first is right here in this text. Um, He says engrossed. uh, Live as if not engrossed in these things. Uh, The word engrossed, if translated literally, there's not a good translation for it into English, means to use it up and abuse it until it is gone. To to cling to it so tightly, you use it for everything it has and then it's worthless. To, you know, to to squeeze every last drop out. He said, don't do that. Don't cling to this world as if all there is is this world. That's secularism, to live as as if the only life we have is this life. But very specifically, when it comes to relationships, I want to look briefly at the book of Revelation where we have a picture of heaven. And here's the picture it gives us in Revelation 19. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. The wedding of the Lamb has come. Now, Jesus was often referred to as the Lamb of God. Uh, The reason why was because in the Old Testament, a lamb was one of the animals sacrificed for the sin of the sinner. Um, The lamb was eaten at the Passover meal, which brought them freedom. Uh, When Jesus showed up on the scene, John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God, giving a reference to Isaiah 53, which says that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers in silence, so he did not open his mouth. He willingly bore our sin in silence. So, When the biblical authors write about heaven, one of the pictures they use to talk about Jesus is the lamb. That's why we love Jesus. He was sacrificed for us. And the most common illustration used to help us understand what heaven's going to be like is the illustration of a wedding, a wedding feast, a wedding reception, a wedding party, the wedding of Jesus. It says, the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride, that bride represents anyone who repents, anyone who trusts in him has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. What this means is um, righteousness, Christ's righteousness, God's holiness, it's given to you as a gift through Jesus. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Here's why Paul says don't get carried away. Here's why Paul says don't live as if you are engrossed with your current relationship status. Marriage is a good thing, not the ultimate thing. It is a good thing. It's not the ultimate thing. Eternity, Jesus, resurrected life is the ultimate thing. 
So if you're married, great. If you're single, great, possibly even better. But the real marriage, the real feast, the real joy is still coming. Okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul wrote, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. In other words, I'm I'm not saying don't get married. I'm not restricting you. If, If you choose marriage, go for it. I'm not saying this to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, the word right means apt or appropriate for the context, right? Um, A swimming suit is right at the beach. It's inappropriate at a formal wedding, okay? It's right. It's appropriate. It says, given the context of where we live, I want you to live in the appropriate way for your context. And then at the end, Paul finally gives the goal for single people to pursue, to live in undivided devotion to the Lord. And that's the goal of singleness. The goal of singleness is undivided devotion. Undivided devotion, a life fully devoted to God, pursuing Him, pursuing His interests, pursuing a spirit, an inner life that is aligned with the heart of God. That's what we were made for. That's where we gain emotional and spiritual health and wisdom and discernment. And if dating or marriage is in your future, if you have the goal of undivided devotion to God when you are single, that will build you up as a person of character and integrity and strength, and you will very quickly be able to discern, not only is this the right person, but it will make you capable of being a person healthy enough for a mature relationship with someone else. So the goal of the single season The target to aim for is undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, I want to wrap up with something interesting Jesus taught on this very topic in Matthew chapter 19. He said, for there are eunuchs who were born that way. Eunuch means you're physically unable to marry, have children. There are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs. They're not eunuchs, but they choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. They choose the single life so they can have a life that is undivided, a life that is free from many troubles, a life to give glory to God and honor Him. And Jesus says the one who can't accept this should accept it. If you can recognize this gift, if you can accept it, both Jesus and Paul, who, by the way, were single, said this is a dignified, wise, honorable, and valuable way to lead your life as someone who is single. Now, he said those who can accept it should accept it. which brings up a very important question. What if I'm single and you say, Jason, I just, I I have tried. I just can't accept it, right? What if I'm single and unhappy? What if I'm single and unhappy? That's an important question. If singleness is a gift, some of you say, this is a gift I did not want to receive. You've received gifts like that before, right? Right, you, you got a fruitcake for Christmas. Um, you unwrapped something and you said, if it's the thought that counts, this gift doesn't count. What were you thinking? This, this is not for me, right? What if for you, you're, you are single and say, this is not the gift I wanted? Two things. Number one, admit the pain. Last week, we learned from Scripture that loneliness 
is the only problem that can either be caused because of sin or because of godliness, because you were made in his image and you desire a companion. Admit that pain. Admit that loneliness. Seek God and pour it out to him. Don't be alone with your loneliness. Don't be isolated in your loneliness. Seek God. Seek Christian community. Seek friendships. But be honest about it. Pour it out to God. Give him the desires of your heart. Let your Father in heaven know about it. Second, choose to trust God. Choose to trust him that if it is a gift from him, then in the end, it will work out for his glory and your good. And learn to use your single time however long it is. It could be a year, it could be for life. Use that time to trust God, to lean into him and pursue undivided devotion to the Lord. He will be your strength, he will be your refuge, and he will make you a whole person whether or not you're in relationship. That's what he wants for you. We'll pick it up there next time. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, you give dignity to all people, and in your scriptures, you really give dignity to all of us who are single. It's a gift. It's a gift of time and fewer troubles to pursue you with all our hearts. For those of us in the room who have this gift, spirit work in us to that we can be genuinely grateful for this season and this gift. For those of us who still desire relationship, that's still a good desire. May our desires be first and foremost set on relationship with you so that at the proper time, we can be in healthy relationship with others. Spirit, for those of us who, who completely missed this goal when we were single, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for your grace in drawing us near anyway. And give us wisdom so that we can pursue our partner and you at the same time, so that we can have healthy relationships that honor you and bless the world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.